Hey everybody, welcome back for another 1113 installment diesel fuel injection pump time. We've got the pump, the governor, and the hour meter in one assembly on the bench. We're going to start getting these things apart. We need to start getting into this pump, seeing what it's going to need. And this is another first generation tech piece that 1113 has been so good about retaining. We can verify that with the serial number. So the pump is going to have a different number than the tractor. This is number 10P3075 on the tag, and on the housing we have the stamping also says 10P3075, so numbers matching there, that's good. The individual cylinder pumps look good, nobody's been hogging these screwdriver slots out or uh, hammering on these crown pieces trying to do all the adjustments that you're not supposed to do anyway. Um, we know this is a first generation pump because serial numbers 10P1 through 10P4339 were the original series of pumps that were on these tractors. So why do we have a 3000 number on the pump when our tractor is only 1113? That's because this is a 5J wide gauge D2 and in 1938 when this was built they were making more 3J narrow gauge D2s than 5Js and the 3Js were also using these pumps. So that's why you have the number discrepancy between the two serials. Quick uh, visual inspection on this. One thing I noticed right away Fuel rack does not move. It doesn't even turn, it doesn't slide anything. So we're gonna have to be really careful in here that we don't pry in anything too hard. Um, hour meter dials actually look pretty darn good. Current reading is 6,966 hours. Who knows if that's accurate, but even the lid still has the, uh, the spring loaded action going on. Kind of liking that. Governor arm, that moves. So that's not completely froze up. Spin this thing around, have a look. Lots of grease back there. I'm pretty sure this hasn't been cleaned since 1938. It'd take a lot of scraping back there to get that cleaned off. But So we're going to start working this pump over. Now straighten it all back out here. Take the governor off. Take the R meter off. Start busting into this thing. See what we have ahead of us. So I'm going to begin by taking the hour meter off. But first I want to have a look under this cap. I want to make sure that I in fact drained all the oil. Yep, it looks dry in there. I want to make sure because uh, when you take this hour beater off, there would be oil running all over the place if, if it was still full. And I just want to mention the oil level for the injection pump should be up into the opening below this cap. That's where the proper oil level is and that's an oil level that, like I said, in the fuel filter tower reconditioning video where we did the front seal here, Link's popping up there in case you forgot all about that. That's the oil level that hardly anybody ever checks. So just uh, two nuts, one there and one there. That hour meter will come off. Okay, have a look at everything. Drive gear looks good. A little bronze gear, pretty much standard on those. Still turns. It's good. Governor cover off next. Uh, it's looking dry in there. Well, that stuff is moving as it should though. Pump cover now. Not bad for being dirty. Also not bad for being rusty in there either. Kind of curious why that rack doesn't move, but yeah, we continue on. Now to get the governor off, I need to disconnect this linkage between the rack and that governor arm. So 7 16 bolts and nuts, they're castellated. Each one has a cotter pin, so you just remove the pin, remove the nuts. We'll take this back one off first because this front bolt will hit the spring when it's in there how it is now. There. There's the bolt. We got that connection broken. Usually this is where I pivot this uh, this rack around so that I can get this bolt out. Let's just see if we can make it turn. Yep, it, it'll turn. I think it's just dry in the bushings. That bolt will come out. Take our connector piece out of there. Just finishing up removing the fasteners that hold the governor housing to the injection pump. Seven total, you got these two on the bottom and then the other five are on the inside. Not too difficult to access. So with those 
loose, or those off, I should say. Work this off slowly. There we go. Now I want to determine if any of the plungers in these individual pumps are stuck and I don't want to just start prying on the rack or anything like that. You can actually damage these things. So I'm going to take this piece, the gear tooth rack out right now, this bolt and this bolt come out and the thing should lift right out of there. There we go. And now I want to check and see if any of these plungers are stuck. Okay, number one's good. We get some movement there. Number two seems a little bit uh, tight. Three's good. And number four is good. That moves. Um, sometimes these can stick, especially on an engine that sat for a while. Uh, the plunger sticks in the barrel up here. One thing you don't want to do is use like prying tools on these geared segments because these segments are only a clamp fit on the plunger and these are set at the factory. If you try prying on these and twist this uh, geared segment out of position on the plunger, it's gonna throw fuel delivery off for that cylinder and without precise equipment, you'll never get that set back to where it was. So we got one, three, and four all look good. I'll pull those pumps out and then we'll carefully deal with uh, number two and see if we can get that plunger loosened up. Removing the individual pumps is pretty simple. Just remove the clamp bolts first and each one is located by a couple of dowels and should have an o-ring under it sealing the fuel passage that leads up into it. So you disengage it from the dowels and then carefully disengage the plunger from the lifter and then everything will fit out the top and these plungers are matched to the barrels. They're match sets, so do not get them mixed up. And tolerances are extremely precise. All this stuff in here has to stay very, very clean. Pulling number three out here. Hopefully you can see a little better how it engages with that lifter yoke. You can just kind of slide it right out. also get a better view of how those are just clamped on. You can see that little Allen head screw. They're split. It's just a friction fit, that geared quadrant. That's why you don't want to pry on that and move it from its original position on that plunger. That's really going to throw fuel delivery off. So I've been working pump number two here. I've pretty well got it freed up already. I didn't expect that it would free up that quick, so I really didn't have any anything on camera. But what I noticed was uh, the lifter was stuck in the down position plunger was also stuck down so i put the clamp bolts back on anchored the pump down to the housing and then put a slotted tool in the camshaft rotated the cam lobe up so it pushed this plunger up into the body and then rotated the cam lobe back down and then i could carefully get back in here between the case and the lifter yoke and pry down on the yoke and that also pulls the plunger back down out of the body sprayed penetrating oil and oil in there worked it a few times and the thing has pretty much freed right up. I tell you what, look at that. Disengage just fine. Plunger looks awesome. So that's very good, makes me happy. Working on the bottom of the pump now, I'm gonna take the base cover off. A little bit black in there, but I've seen worse. Have a look in here, and hmm. I'm seeing some scoring on these cam lobes that I don't like. They should be a lot more polished than that, so maybe this ran a little dry at one point in time. I don't know. So to get the camshaft out, we first need to remove the lifter yokes and these troughs that are right under them. A couple special tools for this. We have this wrench, double-ended wrench. It's a 4B7618 that gives you all of the right angles to get down on the jam nuts. For those lifter yokes, it's got all the offsets and everything. Um, you can get a regular 916 wrench in here, but this just makes life so much easier. And then for the yokes, we have this other wrench here. This is a 
4B7617 and it's got this cross on each end. This end's the big end, that end's the smaller end. The D2 uses the smaller end but that cross piece goes in and that's what you can actually adjust the yoke with. So these tools right here do make life a lot easier. They come up for sale on eBay from time to time. That's where I found these a few years ago. So we'll just go in and loosen the jam nuts under each one of those yokes. There, those are all loose. Now, if we were doing lifter settings, we'd be using this tool to fine tune the height of those yokes, but since we're just taking these out, I find that a large screwdriver with electrical tape covering the end works just fine to thread those out of there. And the lifters are designed so that they do not spin down in the housing, so they will hold themselves stationary. Once they're threaded out, you can see there's the lifter yoke, pulls on the plunger, and that's the trough, as they call it. That trough is there to catch any leakage that may come down from that plunger directs it off to the side and there's a drain tube or drain hole that goes down the back side gets rid of that. With the yokes out of the way next step is to cage these lifters up. What I mean by that is each lifter has a return spring under it keeping it down against those cam lobes and we need to cage those up and get them off the lobes so that we can release tension on the cam slide that out. Uh, to do this you'll need four of these 3 8 bolts by 24 fine thread three inches long and a fender washer for each one. Again, we'll just uh, demonstrate on one of the metal ones because they're easiest to see. Stick it down through the top and engage the threads in the lifter. Once you've grabbed hold of it, just uh, pull it on up. And we don't need to coil bind that spring, but that's that's looking pretty good right there. Repeat for the other three, and now the cam should slide right out. There it is. Let's have a look at it. Yeah, we've definitely got some scoring going on. We don't have polished surfaces on the lobes anymore. That's kind of the worst one right there. Actually, you know, number one doesn't look very good either. Hmm. This might have ran dry at one time. Take a little bit of a look down at those lifters. You can see each one has a roller in it. Hopefully they're still rolling, I don't know. So at this point, we can take the cage bolts out and the return springs will just let those pop out of their bores. And that one freed up. So there is the lifter. You can see why they don't spin on the bottom. They have these two flats, pretty well caged in. Return spring. And this roller rolls. Bit of a rusty spot on. Take a look at this one. And yeah, number two stuck. No rolling action. A bit of a flat spot beginning there too. Not good. All the lifters are out, kept matched up with their respective pumps. And about all that's left in this housing is this rack rod and right here, that little flat spring abutment that it comes up against. You don't have to take this rod out of here. I'm gonna do it, if anything, just for demonstration purposes. And it's gonna let me clean this a little bit better but you don't wanna mess with this piece unless you can get it set back exactly the way it was because this has a lot to do with fuel rack adjustment and you have this main adjustment nut. There's a jam nut and we look on the bottom here, you can see the slot and right off the end of my finger, a little square lock. That lock is an L-shaped piece. One leg goes down in the slot beneath the jam nut. The other leg sticks up on the face of this main adjustment nut. And you can see we have an open slot there, another one there, another one there. 
they give you plenty of options there just to uh, get this thing set exactly where it needs to be. You do need special tools to get this set properly. So make all your necessary measurements. What I do is measure from the end of the rod to the face of the main adjustment nut. And I'll also count the turns as this goes off as well as mark which slot that lock was in. That pretty much assures you're gonna get exactly back where it was. So I'll hold the main nut. We'll carefully crack that gem nut loose. Take that right off. Roll it around to where we see that L-shaped lock. So we'll do our best to dig that out of there without damaging it. There we go. You can see just a little L-shaped piece easily broken and with a little white paint mark indicating which notch that lock was in we will thread this off and count the turns rod can now slide out and to take this little cushion spring off fold the lock tabs back remove the bolts and we have a block, we have the little spring, and then there's a shim back behind there. All rest on that dowel. Just make sure everything gets reassembled exactly as it was. So the last piece I'm gonna take out of this housing is this round plug that's on the back right here. What that does, it seals the opposite end of the main fuel passage that feeds all of those pumps that go along the top. And what I'll usually do to take that out, it is threaded. Um, the center of it has a threaded hole in there. You could uh, use a bolt to pull it out. Brass drift, for me, works just as well. And just tap it out. There we are. It's always a good idea to replace that O-ring. So that's pretty much the complete disassembly process for a D3400 injection pump. I got a lot of cleanup to do here. Um, I'm also going to pull all the studs out of this, give it a good cleaning, check gasket surfaces. You guys should pretty much know that routine by now. Kind of unfortunate what I found with the, uh, the light scoring on this cam, plus the condition of those lifters. I think it goes back to what I was talking about with the condition of this seal in here and people not checking the oil in that pump reservoir. But it happens. That's not the first time I've seen it. One bit of good news, I found what looks like a really good camshaft in my parts stockpile. This is out of that junkyard D3400 I bought for 100 bucks a few years ago. That's the one that lent two of its pistons to the 1113 build. You can click right there to relive all that. And I was hoping I'd find some good lifters out of that too. But unfortunately, these have a lot of wear where they've been going up and down in the bottom of the pump. You can see quite the wear ridge on the bottom of that one so rollers are kind of stiff too that thing was pretty dry inside but i made some calls i got four new old stock lifters on their way so we're gonna be down a couple days waiting for parts anyway i'm gonna proceed with the cleanup on that i got a lot of stuff i can keep busy with in the meantime so we're gonna wrap the video right here thanks for watching everybody please tune in again